Greetings, happy coders, and welcome to another video. Today, we are back in the saddle with Usborne Books, Understanding Machine Code for Beginners. And in our case, we're looking, of course, as you know, at the ZX Spectrum. Now, in the previous episode, we looked at the history of counting. We went back several thousand years and looked at some of those basic principles. I hope you enjoyed it. If you haven't seen it, please go back and watch it because uh, I think you'll find it useful. And we'll be continuing a little bit of that today, looking more closely at the machine itself. And although some of this is a little bit dry, I hope that um, you'll stick with it because I cannot stress enough how important it is when it comes to writing code, that you have an idea and you understand these basic principles, how the machine is working, why it is that we do what we do. Sometimes, as humans, it seems counterintuitive, but to the machine, it's completely logical. And I think this is one of the reasons why some people find coding in these uh, low-level languages quite impenetrable, because you really have to kind of get into the mindset of a machine, if you like. That was uh, my little pun that I made last time about the sort of being like the Borg or something. But it's quite fun, I promise. It's not painful. <laughs> you just have to uh, be ready to to think in a, in a slightly different way. And if you can understand how that works, and, and I, I'll give you some examples today, some, uh, some colorful metaphors to help you to understand that. And once you start doing that, you'll understand why it is that you're doing it that way. And um, and then the fun will, will begin, I hope. I mean, I personally found that when I started with machine language, it was difficult to get started because I, I didn't really understand what was going on at the ground level, let's say. And um, eventually I did, of course. But for me personally, it would have been great if I'd learned a few more things about the basics and had those ideas before I started the journey, let's say. And that means I would have probably got off to a better start that didn't test my patience as much as it uh, did at first. It can be frustrating working in assembly language. It is going to be frustrating. I'm not going to deny that. But it is also a lot of fun. And uh, you get a great sense of fulfillment from being able to code a machine at that base level. So I hope you'll stick with it. And uh, let's see where we get to. So today, as I said, we're going to expand a little bit on what we've already discussed, looking at how the processor interacts with other parts of the computer, how we handle bigger numbers, uh, greater than 8-bit numbers, and a little bit about hexadecimal. So we'll touch on all those things just a little. And uh, the good news is that uh, once we've got a handle on those, we can start looking at how we can move those numbers around and actually do some real coding, which, of course, is why you're here. So, as you'll recall from the previous video, please go back and watch it if you haven't, then uh, the Z80 works with 8-bit numbers. In essence, what we're doing is taking numbers from memory, sending them to the chip, which then performs mathematical operations on them, provides us with the results, which can then be sent back to the memory. Or, to put it in a more human way, let's think of it like a busy restaurant. Customers place orders. The waiter takes those orders to the kitchen. The cook receives the orders, cooks the meals, brings the, gives the food to the waiter, and the waiter brings the result back to the customer. So in coding terms, you're the customer, you're the coder, you give out the instructions. The Z80 is the chef cooking the dinner. And the waiter, in this case, is what we call a bus. In this case, a data bus. And that is to say it's a vehicle for moving data from one place to another. Moving numbers from one place to another, let's say. So, because it could also be instructions, as we saw in episode one, if you haven't seen it. So, if we wanted to order several meals at once, of course, which you might do in a restaurant, that's perfectly possible, but chances are this is going to take a bit more time. That's because the chef can only cook so much at once and the waiters can only carry so much at once. So when we look at the ZX Spectrum, it's like a very small family restaurant, let's say. The chef doesn't get a lot of help in the kitchen. There's only one waiter. So if we're not careful about how we plan the orders, things are going to slow down. And in terms of coding games, that's something we want to avoid because obviously... Just like in a restaurant, if all the orders came in at once, then things are going to get, you're going to create a backlog and that's going to create slowdown and problems. So, in practical terms, 
as we mentioned before. The Z80 uses an 8-bit data bus, which means it can only carry 8 bits at once. This means we can only work in terms of numbers from 0 to 255 within one pulse. So if you imagine we're sending a pulse and there are 8 pulses on the line, and they can be 1 or 0, and so we can send an 8-bit number. Again, previous videos if you haven't already. This doesn't mean we can't have bigger numbers, of course. It just means that when we're thinking about speed, we try to think of ter in terms of 8 bits wherever we can, and we try to plan it so that when we're dealing with larger numbers, we don't slow things down by asking too much at once, let's say. So that's a basic principle of coding in assembly for an 8-bit machine. Now, let's look at the Usborne book again. This time we're on pages 6 and 7. So the download for the book is available in the link. And so please uh, find that and go ahead and take a look. And we'll go through a few important points here. So let's start. We'll look at the ROM and the RAM over here. I'm guessing you probably know the difference between ROM and RAM, but I'll explain for those that aren't too sure. So as it says here, the ROM holds a set of common subroutines that are particular to the machine that you're using. They are read-only, right? So that means that the CPU can follow the instructions but can't write data to that area. It's read-only. So it can receive instructions but it can't write instructions or code to that area. So I'm sure you're familiar with uh, CD-ROM, for example, right? And that's the same principle. You can play the CD but you can't record onto it. So a simple example of the ROM in use would be when you switch on the Spectrum. It's a bit like a boot-up sequence on a modern PC. It reads instructions from the ROM that tell it to set up the computer and then print 1982 Sinclair Research like that on the screen. And then it waits for the user to do something. It'll be checking the keyboard. That's another ROM routine. So it's basically a set of different routines that the computer can fall back on when, it, when needed, the most commonly used routines that you might use. And of course, it also contains all of the basic subroutines and code as well, including things like the, uh, the font and so on. So that's all in the ROM. Now, the RAM, on the other hand, can be both read and written to. And unlike the ROM, it's usually wiped when the machine is reset. So if we continue our analogy, we could say that the computer's memory is used for storage, like a set of cupboards or shelves. So in the ROM, you have the pots and pans and the dishes and the plates and the essential ingredients that the chef needs every day. And those are always available to him or her. Whereas the RAM is like uh, empty cupboards that can be filled up with whatever you need on a particular day and then emptied when the restaurant closes. So ROM is already filled with useful things that you can use depending on what you want, depending on the machine. And the RAM is completely empty and you can use it in any way you like. Okay, so taking a look at the diagram, it's a fairly simple diagram. And one of the things missing from here, if you were to think about this in terms of the spectrum, would be there is no ULA chip. Now, I'm sure you've heard of the ULA chip. I'm not going to go into too much technical detail here. If you are technically minded, of course, there's plenty of information on the internet. But this is not an episode about exactly how these things work. As I said, it's more a case of helping you understand at a basic level the principles that, that, that we're dealing with here. So I'll stretch our restaurant metaphor just a little bit further and say that the ULA is something like a front of house person or a maitre d' that deals with the ways that the restaurant interacts with the outside world, let's say. So if it was a restaurant, it might be processing payments or printing menus and, of course, interacting with the kitchen if necessary. In the case of an old computer like this, the ULA allows the CPU to interact with the outside world, that is to say the user or, in the case of the game, the player. Or in the case of if you're coding, then it would be obviously you as a coder if you were writing something in BASIC. So it displays information on the screen, it would check the keyboard, it would enable you to connect to external peripherals and so on. So, of course, those of you that are more technically minded will tell me that that's an oversimplification and you would be correct. It is. And uh, that's the purpose of this. Because I'm just skating over the top, I just want people to understand more or less the basic principles of what's going on, 
with regard to uh, coding in, in uh, Z80. So we don't need to know absolutely everything that's happening. But what we do need to know is um, that the ULA and the CPU are working together. And if and when you want your code to interact with the outside world, which of course you would if you were going to create a game, then the CPU and the ULA need to talk to one another and play nicely. So we'll be looking at this in further detail further down the line. But again, when we talk about efficiency, they both make use of the data bus. So making sure that these two partners work well together at peak efficiency and don't get in each other's way involves a certain amount of time management. And time management is a big part of coding at this kind of low level. You have to balance the fact that the CPU works at its most efficient when left to its own devices with the reality that your code is ultimately presented to the user, which involves the ULA. So you'd have to make sure that they work in tandem because when they don't, you can end up with issues like screen flickering, stuttering sounds, input lag, and so on. So we have to make sure essentially that the front end and the back end of the donkey are moving in the same direction. Okay, so as I said, we'll be going into all of this in more depth in a future episode. But for now, let's focus on what we can see in the picture here, the CPU interacting with the memory. As you can see, as well as the 8-bit data bus, we also here we have an address bus. Now, as you can tell by the name, the address bus is used to determine where in the memory the data is read or written to. That is to say, which address. So if the data bus is essentially sending what we want, the address bus is dealing with where we want it to go or where it's coming from. Now, in the case of addresses, if we were to use an 8-bit number, we would limit ourselves to only 256 addresses because, as we've already mentioned, 8 bits, maximum number, 255. 0 to 255, 256 numbers. So the address box effectively uses two 8-bit numbers at once to create a 16-bit address. Now, a simple way to think of this is to imagine a street with 256 houses. It's a long street. And each one of those houses is given a number from 0 to 255. Then imagine that you also have 256 of those streets, each numbered likewise. So you have a street number and you have a house number, right? So to get the address of any house within that grid, we would have a street number, which in the case of working with the CPU, we call that the high byte. And we would also have a house number. And the house number we call the low byte. Working together, they would give us 256 houses per street and 256 streets. So that would be 256 times 256 unique addresses, which is a total of 65,536, which we refer to roughly as 64K. But wait, I hear you cry. The ZX Spectrum is 48K, not 64. And you'd be correct. If you were talking about available RAM. However, once you include the 16K ROM, you bring the total up to 64K. So the first 16K in the spectrum holds the ROM. The rest of the memory is the RAM. So a 16K machine has 16K ROM and 16K RAM. The 48K spectrum has 16K ROM and then it has 48K RAM, bringing a total of 64. So as you can imagine, in our kitchen, in our metaphorical kitchen, we've got some of the cupboards which are full of pans and pots and ingredients, and then we've got another set of cupboards which is empty. So in the case of a 16K, you've got half the cupboard space used and the other half empty. In the case of 48K, you have a quarter of the space used by the ROM and three quarters empty for you to use. At any rate, we'll be looking more closely at the spectrum memory layout and how it works in another future episode. But what's important to remember now is this street and house style of referencing, because as you can probably surmise, it allows us to work with 16-bit addresses using two individual 8-bit numbers, which is just how the Z80 likes to work. So that makes it all the more efficient. So to finish up, let's go back to the numbers. So far, we've been dealing with binary, 
which machines prefer, and decimal, which humans prefer. Asking either of these to work in the other gets complicated very quickly. So, in order to combine the machine-friendly aspects of binary with the human-friendly compactness of decimal, we use another base, hexadecimal. Let's look at our 8-bit number from the previous episode. And, by the way, don't forget to like and subscribe if you're enjoying this. Okay, so, if you've done your homework from the previous lesson, you'll know that this binary number in decimal would be 251. But how does hexadecimal work, and why is it useful? Well, if you take a look at the number here, as we mentioned before, there are 256 possible combinations of bits 1 and 0. There's no possible way, of course, that we want to use 256 symbols to represent every single possible combination. So, let's split the number into two halves of four bits each. These four-bit numbers are called nibbles. Since we have four bits, we know that the total possible combinations will be 2 times 2 times 2 times 2. 2 to the power 4, which is 16. So, if we use 16 symbols to represent these, we'll have something that would be more human-readable than binary, but still remaining fairly machine-friendly in such a way that we can understand how the machine is going to interpret this number. Obviously, the machine doesn't read hexadecimal, but what it does do is give us an idea of where we're working when we're dealing with the numbers in terms of the structure. So, there'll be more on that later. Obviously, for the numbers 0 to 9, we can use the decimal numbers. That's 10 numerals. For the other 6, we can use the first 6 letters of the alphabet. So, we use A to represent 10, B for 11, all the way up to F, which represents 15. So we'll then have 16 uh, numerals from 0 to F. Let's look at this low nibble here. So as you can work out, this is the number 1 plus 2 plus 8, so that's 11 in decimal. But we want to use a single symbol to represent those four bits. So we'll use the letter B, because that's the symbol we've decided to use that means 11. Now, let's look at the high nibble, which, of course, is on the left side. Now, this one is at its maximum, 8 plus 4 plus 2 plus 1, that's 15. So, we'll use the letter F to represent that. Now, because 16 is a power of 2, in other words, 2 to the power of 4 is 16, we can simply join these two numbers together to make a single hexadecimal number, FB. So, if you look at the diagram here, You'll see there we have FB. This section represents 2 to the power 0, 1, 2, 3, as we did before. And here we have 2 to the power of 4, which of course is 16. And then the next one, of course, above that, as we know, is 32. And the next one is 64, and so on. So, because we're effectively multiplying the whole thing by 16 in order to move it across, that is why it allows us to join the two together to display a single hexadecimal number. So the number FB in hex is 251 in decimal, and any number between 0 and 255 can be represented by just two symbols, which is a lot easier to work with than eight zeros or ones. So the lowest number is still 0, 0, 0 and the highest number, 255, is represented by FF. Better yet, because 256 is the power of 16, we can represent a full 16-bit address using only four symbols. Because two symbols represent an 8-bit address, another two symbols represent our second 8-bit address, and so we can put them together, just as we do with the two binary numbers, to represent one 16-bit address. So we use four figures. So if we go back to the analogy that we mentioned before about the house number and the street number, we know that the low byte, can rep or the house if you like, can be represented by two single numerals in hex, and the high byte can also be represented, which means that any address in the whole 8-bit memory system can be represented by only four numerals, which is, of course, a lot easier to work with. So... Let's look at one single example of that. You'll remember, we mentioned before, 
The first 16K of the Spectrum's memory is the ROM. Following that, we have the screen RAM and then the rest of the RAM which flows. We'll be looking at that probably in the next episode. The start of the screen memory is address 16384. Now in decimal, that's quite an arbitrary number, but let's look at it in hexadecimal. There you go, and as you can see, this address becomes a very round number and it makes a lot more sense because there you've got 16K represented and this borderline here at 4000 is, a, is on an exact line between the RAM and the ROM. Incidentally, the dollar sign that's, that's used here is used to denote that this number is in hex so that you wouldn't confuse it with, say, the number 4000 in um, decimal. Now, some people don't use the dollar sign. Some people use an ampersand or an ampersand with an H. There are a couple of different ones. I've, I've settled on the dollar. Some people use it, others don't. You can use what you like as long as you understand what it is. Most people will understand what you mean if you use w one or other of these. My advice would be to uh, choose the one you like and then be consistent with it. Binary, by the way, is usually represented or preceded by a percentage because the percentage symbol looks a little bit like a zero two zeros and a one. And um, if you want to play about a little bit more with converting from binary to hex and to decimal, then uh, you can use the Windows uh, calculator. I'm going to show you here. You set it to programmer mode. You can put a number in like this. And then you can switch between binary and decimal and hexadecimal. Okay, so I think that's enough for today. In the next lesson, we'll start looking at the memory layout since we know how addresses are formed and we can start thinking about how we can get the processor to interact with the memory and start using some numbers. So I hope you enjoyed it. As I said, please remember to like and subscribe. And uh, if you have any questions, of course, I very much welcome those and feedback too. It's always good to know if you've been enjoying it and if you found it easy to follow and so on. So uh, yeah, we should be back with the next one in these series in a couple of weeks. In the meantime, if you'd like to know more, I'd like to recommend my fellow YouTuber, Matt Heffernan. The link is going to appear now. Uh, he's also just started a series on Z80 and the ZX Spectrum. So we hooked up together and decided that we should uh, try to encourage you to watch both of our channels so that you can get a perspective from two different teachers, so to speak, and be able to uh, double up your fun, let's say. Okay, so go and check out Matt. He's a really good guy, and uh, he explains things really well, and uh, I hope you'll enjoy his work. And uh, I'll be back, as I said, in a few weeks, and as always, happy coding. Bye-bye. This video would not be possible without the amazing contributions from the people whose names you can see scrolling up the screen right now. If you'd like to be one of them, you can get all my games for free, you can get some coding tips, you can even get to dictate which games I work on in the future, and you might even feature in them. So, if that sounds good to you, then head over to the Patreon page, the link is just coming up now, and in the meantime, happy coding. Bye-bye!